Um, and the runner-up is Miles Reed, and he's going to present about his work. So Miles is from the University of Wisconsin Medicine, and he's going to talk about cosmogenic tadpole a landscape evolution model with cosmogenic nuclei and uh, conservation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for recognizing this uh, this paper. So. Yeah, this is a landscape evolution model, cosmogenic radionuclide uh, conservation. It was done in collaboration with Ken Ferrier, my advisor, and Caleb Perone. Uh, this is a Cassé supernova remnant in the background. It's a producer of cosmic rays in our galaxy. And these can travel to Earth and produce uh, uh, in-situ terrestrial cosmogenic nuclides, or TCNs for short, in bedrock and in soil. And a lot of people have used these uh, over the past couple of decades. There's over 4,000 denudation rates, uh, probably more now. And that's the combined physical and chemical erosion rate. That's what these are getting at over the long term. And it's one of the few ways to uh, get this data. And you can use them for a lot of different applications. But people have been putting these into models as well over the years and different sort of styles. Uh, but the Basically, the time had come to put these in a full-scale landscape evolution model where topography and uh, TCN concentrations are developing in tandem because you can do a lot of different things. And I'm highlighting a recent model by Sebastian Cartier and others uh, came out just recently. So what's landscape evolution modeling? Uh, we got a kind of a, a dose of that yesterday uh, in a really cool talk. But it's just a collection of numerical representations of geomorphic processes that you can evolve topography, uh, you know, forward uh, in time to test theory or, uh, you know, apply it to a different landscape. And it's called, I'm using uh, Tadpole by Taylor Perone. It's called Tadpole because it had leapfrog integration at some point. So they thought that was clever. And uh, what are TCNs or cosmogenic nuclides? Like I said, these cosmic rays come from outer space. Uh, and they're highly energetic. They cause nuclear, uh, you know, inter interactions uh, in the atmosphere. That's where you get carbon-14. And eventually you can get rare isotopes like beryllium-10 uh, in the soil uh, via uh, different reactions uh, with things like oxygen. And you can measure these on highly uh, specialized instruments, uh, accelerator mass spectrometers. But you can get the exposure ages of a, you know, a non-eroding surface or a denudation rate of an eroding surface. So I, I, what I did was I made a novel model by including a TCN balance within a pre-existing mass balance uh, landscape evolution model. So this has two layers. It's just showing a cell for, for this synthetic landscape here. And it has a soil, explicitly modeled soil, and a, a bedrock. And it involves uh, you know, physical erosion by nonlinear hill slope transport. And it has an exponential soil production function. These all can all be sort of you know, customized with different uh, laws and things. But it also has chemical erosion in the soil. And you can give it a, you know, a vector of so, uh, concentrations uh, of minerals in the bedrock and those evolve uh, within the soil. And over in the TCM balance, uh, you have uh, production of TCNs in the soil, and that changes every time step by, you know, by the elevation. As elevations change, the production rates change because you have uh, uh, basically uh, less atmosphere to go through. And we also modeled the concentration at depth at, at the bedrock soil interface and uh, below uh, in, a, in a profile. And there's production, you know, and decay down there too. And this is the uh, governing equation for uh, TCNs in the soil through time. We'll go through it in excruciating detail. But uh, it has production in the soil, supply from below from soil production, the hill slope transport, which you can, you can have a non-linear or linear or whatever you want in there, and also decay and chemical erosion if your host mineral is, uh, is not quartz, it's, uh, if, if it's not uh, inert, if it's weatherable. And then you have to invert that concentration back into a denudation rate. And we use, uh, since we have chemical erosion in the soil, we use this chemical erosion factor which takes into effect the, the uh, enrichment of the host mineral. Okay, so we're going to look at some transient responses, and this is on you know square domain with a, you know the elevations pinned at the edges, and in this uh, version I'm showing you we have static channels that act as just sort of a way to evacuate 
uh, sediment, very simple treatment, but when you increase the bedrock uplift rate, you're going to transmit that signal up to the hill slopes. And over here, this DAC is the actual denudation rate where you're just combining the physical and chemical erosion rate. And you can see it more clearly that you just transmit it up into the ridge. But over in the inferred, where if you were to measure at every point an inferred denudation rate, it's a little bit muddled because you have hill slope transport coming down slope from areas that haven't uh, been adjusted to this uh, new uh, regime of bedrock uplift. Okay, but you can look at the difference between inferred denudation rate and the actual, which is called D diff here, and it's near zero at ridges the entire time. So if it's that sort of off-white color, it's at local steady state, meaning that the, the actual and the inferred uh, aren't very different. Now this is good news to people who get things like soil production rates because they're going out onto ridges and looking at soil thicknesses and thinking about how quickly soil is being produced. And even if you're in a transient, uh, you know, evolving system, perhaps those uh, rates are accurate. That's sort of one reason why we wanted to, to make something like this. How accurate are or different methods and just for exploration type purposes. And basin average rates, if we're just to isolate this little basin here, uh, the differential with that same uh, perturbation doesn't really uh, affect the, the, dif the differential that much, meaning that the basin average rate through time is pretty accurate, which is uh, good news. And that's just comparing the uh, the inferred for the, the, the whole basin and the mean of the entire basin, the actual rate. If you add stream power into the model, it changes the response a bit uh, on the hill slopes, you know, as you get this incision wave going up into the headwaters. But really, the, the magnitude of the differentials and also the response of uh, a basin, which uh, is one of the basins off to the side, one of the larger ones, it's really not that different either. It uh, doesn't really get that large, meaning that that measurement would be accurate. You know, if you were to measure, have a worker uh, measure every year for, for a million years. So the take-home messages for this is that this is possible now, uh, you know, in 2D, 2.5D, whatever you want to say. And ridges are close to local steady state during this style of transients. And the basin average and for denudation rate for uplift rate change was oh, pretty accurate. And the stream power incision changes response, but not by awful much. And the TCN enabled models produce an output beyond topography uh, within process based framework. So potentially, uh, you know, when you're testing a landscape evolution model, you can just see topography. That's all it really produces, right? But this is something that you could go out and test in the field as well and it's a little more sticky because it accumulates slowly. So we're going to apply this to a real landscape here. This is Little Lake, Oregon in the Oregon Coast Range. Uh, you can see it's flat, kind of in the middle, and that's a Paleo Lake deposit. And it was dammed about 50,000 years ago. And Jill Marshall and, and others, including Josh Roaring, which we're working with on this, they got a bunch of paleo denudation rates, so that's using beryllium tin and an independent burial age from something like carbon-14 uh, dating to, to get at denudation rates through time and their, uh, how they adjusted to, to climate over this time period because you are sampling the, LG, the, you know, the transition to the LGM. And they partition these rates into physical and chemical erosion uh, as well. So this is from a previous core. This area has been used for paleoecological research for quite a long time. And it clearly shows in the kind of pollen index uh, and inferred temperature uh, realm that there was a decay in temperature uh, through time as you go towards the LGM. And from the core, they saw an increase uh, in denudation rate about two, over, over two and a half times. And, you know, in a soil mantled landscape, that can, that can be quite uh, a big change. And the chemical depletion fraction, that's the uh, amount of denudation rate coming from chemical erosion, and that decreased through time. Okay, so they think this is caused by paraglaciation, a transition to like frost heave and frost cracking, 
instead of uh, just uh, downslope transport via you know, tree throw and things like that. So what I did was created some paleo topography and sized through this lake deposit, generated some steady state topography, uh, paleo topography. And this is you know, our best uh, guess at this. And then when the time comes, we can in place a lake, which acts as an ultimate sort of sink for the sediment coming off the hill slopes. And, it's, and it has no erosive uh, power of its own. But I'd like to hear from people that could uh, potentially point me to a way to parameterize that in a long-term sort of scenario. And what I did was apply uh, a simplified temperature curve uh, to control hill slope transport efficiency via a previously existing framework. And this, this curve here is the input parameter. It's coming from the paleoecology and a downscale uh, climate model. And what it does is simulate frost heave and how that would uh, control uh, the efficiency of soil transport. So how, how much flux would you get for a given gradient? And this is based on the mean annual temperature and the thickness of the, uh, of the soil. And it's coupled to a nonlinear uh, soil transport model. Okay, and there's also a temperature control on soil production via frost cracking uh, from uh, segregation ice growth within uh, the bedrock. And this is a model by uh, Rimpel and others. And this is just showing uh, some different towns in the United States during the LGM uh, based on the annual amplitude of the temperature and the mean annual temperature, they would have transitioned into a regime that would have been uh, conducive to cracking of rock. So this can happen uh, in areas that you, know, may, you may not think have been affected by the, um, the ice age, but it, it was. And what we do is we use uh, this sort of frost cracking intensity to, to change the soil production uh, in, uh, efficiency with a constant just to, to, to give a way to see, like, how, how would that affect uh, soil thickness and denudation rate in general. So what we do is in place the lake, and then these processes take over, these paraglacial processes, and you get this immediate uh, increase in your uh, actual denudation rate as temperatures decay, because you start getting into that frost heave uh, regime. And your inferred denudation rate in blue kind of comes up slower because there's a slow response because you you have to have that hill slope transport all the way into the lake to start to see that denudation rate. And this is the average, uh, H is the average soil thickness across the, the basin. And that immediate uptick in soil transport actually strips the soil until you have some uh, cracking of the rock that can produce it later on. And you also see a decrease in the uh, fraction of uh, denudation rate coming from chemical erosion. Okay, so that's just some preliminary modeling and just the take home message is that it supports their hypothesis that paraglaciation uh, probably increased uh, these denudation rates. And another one is that landscape evolution models with an integrated cosmogenic nuclide tracer mm -hmm. offer a way to explore climate's role on denudation rates. And the future work uh, I'd like to do is to port this framework over to Land Lab or potentially Caesar Lewis flood, another model, and then I'm going to apply it to uh, massively human altered landscapes. Okay, and with that, I'll just take any any questions. Thank you. That was really cool. Uh, I was wondering if you've thought at all about the possible impact of landsliding on exposing the, or changing the measured denudation rates or releasing different things. And then I would uh, also add that I definitely think you should put it into Land Lab so that we can do that together. That's a, that's a great question. Um, landslides are you know, extremely common you know, out in the Oregon coast range. Um, but we didn't see, at least in our framework, uh, a good way to parameterize deep-seated landsliding. They didn't see, they didn't think that deep-seated landsliding happened during the course of this uh, sort of event that's captured in the core, uh, based on sort of, you know, how the, uh, they think it could have happened in certain locations, 
let me take that back, that there are some age reverse carbon. So, so it's potential that it, it was there, that, that you might have had a, like a small scale uh, debris flow or something. But we just can't, uh, we just don't have a good uh, implementation of debris flows or deep seated landslides. So we're just, just going to uh, model the uh, nonlinear hill slope transport. But yeah, I, I do, I would like to port it uh, over to Land Lab just so it can sort of start interacting with other processes and be just a general layer that you just have in every single model. That it's, it's not something that's special and, and secluded to this, but something that you can put uh, almost in, into everything. Oh, thanks a lot. That was really interesting. So uh, my question is like, if you're modeling a long time scale, it seems like uh, cosmogenic nuclei have a huge impact on, a uh, huge implication for ice sheet modeling. So, so like if you think about like uh, ice sheet, it's like blocking the cosmogenic nuclei and it was like huge impact on the cosmogenic nuclei budget as well. So if you think about like how to incorporate ice sheet there and do you yeah. have, ever think about yeah, the implication? Yeah, pe people problem? already have. Um, I say that, you know, the time has come for people to put them in landscape evolution models, but um, Eggholm's group over in Aarhus, uh, Denmark, they've really already been doing this with ice sheets because ice sheet modelers are, seem to always be out ahead of other yeah. people. <laughs> and uh, yes, you, and, they, and they are doing this with uh, cosmogenic nuclides because it's, it's somewhat easier because they don't really think about sediment transport and it's all about like exposure ages and stuff like that. Yeah, but I have a so people are already doing that, and someone to look up would be like Egholm or um, some of the students like Skov. Or okay, because like uh, I haven't heard about like they consider like budget of cosmogenic nuclei or whatever. So it's kind of interesting to hear about that. Yeah, they're they're doing it. You should check it out. Uh, thank you.